Hey, what's up everybody? In this video, we're going to talk about chemical formulas and molecular models. So this is a map of the United States of America, which is my home country. And as you probably already know by now, the USA is divided into these 50 territories called states, and each state has its own unique two-letter abbreviation. Now these two-letter abbreviations are quite useful because they're short and they're easy to use. And this can come in real handy, especially when you're dealing with long-winded state names like Massachusetts or California. Sometimes it's not always necessary to write out the entire name of the state. Um, in many cases, it's just as useful just to use the state's two-letter abbreviation. So this is basically the same way that chemical formulas work. Chemical formulas are by far the easiest way to represent a compound. We, in other words, we don't always have to name the compound, we can just use that compound's chemical formula. And chemical formulas are going to show us at least two things. First of all, they're going to show us which elements are in a compound, and they're also going to show us the relative numbers of atoms of these elements that are in the compound. So depending on which chemical formula you use, there actually might be uh, more information within that chemical formula, but definitely uh, all chemical formulas will show you at least these two things. So for instance, the formula H2O, that's the chemical formula for water. This formula tells us that there is a two to one ratio of hydrogen to oxygen. Uh, NaCl, that's the formula for sodium chloride. This formula tells us that there is a one to one ratio of sodium to chlorine. CO, that's the formula for carbon monoxide, in which there is a one-to-one -one ratio of carbon to oxygen. And NH3, that's the formula for ammonia, in which there is a one-to-three ratio of nitrogen to hydrogen. So notice that we have chemical symbols, which are representing the elements, and then we have subscripts, which indicate the relative amounts of the elements. And notice also that the subscript of one is omitted. It is understood, but not shown. So within chemical formulas, we basically have two main types of chemical formulas, which we call empirical formulas and molecular form formulas. Now, empirical formulas, those are going to show us the relative numbers of atoms of each element, while the molecular formulas are going to show us the absolute numbers of atoms of each element. So in other words, what the empirical formula shows us is the lowest reduced ratio of uh, the numbers of atoms uh, with respect to one another. And the molecular formula is going to show us exactly how many atoms of each individual element we have. So in other words, the molecular formula is always going to be some whole number multiple of the empirical formula. So I know that may sound a little confusing, but once we do a couple of examples, um, I, I think you'll, um, you'll understand it a little bit better. So let's do that. So let's start with glucose. Now glucose has six carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms, and six oxygen atoms. So that means that the molecular formula, again, remember that the molecular formula shows exactly how many atoms of each element there are. That molecular formula is gonna be C6H12O6. So let's see if we can't figure out the empirical formula of glucose. So basically what we're trying to do to get the empirical formula is we're trying to, again, we're trying to get the lowest, you know, the reduced ratio of all of these numbers to one another. So basically what we're doing is we're trying to find the greatest common factor of 6, 12, and 6, which is 6, right? 6 is the largest number that divides evenly into all three of these numbers. So if we divide, so let's start with carbon. If we divide 6 by 6, we're going to get 1. So that means our subscript in front of the carbon is going to be 1, but again, that's usually understood and not shown, right? If we divide 12 by 6, moving on to hydrogen, if we divide 12 by 6, that's going to give us 2, so that, so that means our subscript in front of the hydrogen is 2. And then just like the carbon atom, which uh, we, we divided 6 by 6 here, we're going to do the same thing with the oxygen, and that's going to give us a subscript of 1. So that means that our empirical formula for glucose is CH2O. So this tells us that, that we have a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen, even though we have 6 carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms, and 6 oxygen atoms. So that's basically the difference between empirical and molecular formulas. Now let's see if we can't figure out uh, another example. So this is hexane, and the molecular formula for hexane is C6H14. There are six carbon atoms and 14 hydrogen atoms in hexane. So let's figure out the empirical formula for hexane. Now the only number, or excuse me, the highest number that's going to divide evenly into six and 14 is two. It's not three. Three divides into six, but three won't divide evenly into 14. So we're going to divide both of these numbers, six and 14, by two. 
divide six by two and that'll give you three. So that means our subscript in front of the carbon is three. And we divide 14 by two and that's gonna give us seven. So that means our subscript in front of the hydrogen atom is seven. So that means that our empirical formula for hexane is C3H7. Let's do a third example, shall we? This is cyclohexane. The molecular formula for cyclohexane is C6H6. So let's calculate its empirical formula. Well, the greatest common factor of two identical numbers is just gonna be that number. So we're gonna divide both of these numbers by six and that's gonna give us CH. Again, because we have a one-to-one -one ratio of carbon to hydrogen in cyclohexane. So let's do one more example just to make sure we got it down pat. Let's do water. The molecular formula for water, as you know, is H2O. So let's calculate water's empirical formula. Well, it turns out that this, these numbers are already in their reduced form. There's no way to get a number that's gonna divide evenly into, high, uh, into two and one. The only number that does that is one. And of course, if you divide anything by one, you're just gonna get whatever that number is. So that means that the empirical formula for water is also H2O. So sometimes this happens. Sometimes, sometimes the empirical formula and molecular formula of a compound are identical to one another. This happens all the time. So hopefully uh, this has shed some light on the difference between uh, empirical and molecular formulas. Notice that if you're given a molecular formula, you can always uh, go to the empirical formula, but if you're given only the empirical formula of a compound, you need a little bit more information to figure out the molecular formula. Uh, so there you have it. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about structural formulas. Now these are chemical formulas that are um, even more specific because they show connectivity. So in other words, they actually show which atoms are bonded to which. And depending on who draws the structural formula, the structural formula may also show geometry. So as an example, let's consider the molecule ethanol. And ethanol has the molecular formula C2H6O. That is also ethanol's empirical formula. And if we were to write out a structural formula for ethanol, it would look something like this. Now, notice how detailed this is. This shows us exactly which atoms are connected to which. It shows us that, that we have two carbons bonded to one another. One of those carbons has three hydrogens bonded to it, and the other has two hydrogens and an oxygen bonded to it, and then that oxygen also has another hydrogen bonded to it. So this is a valid structural formula for ethanol, but it, this formula here actually doesn't really show geometry. In other words, the bond angles between this hydrogen and this hydrogen and this hydrogen and this hydrogen, for instance, these bond angles are not actually 90 degrees. If we were to, uh, to write a structural formula for ethanol that was more geometrically, geometrically accurate, then we would write something like this. So this is what ethanol really looks like in terms of, at least, I mean, you know, we all know that the atoms aren't necessarily uh, letters, but this is more accurate geometrically than this is. So basically what's going on here is that the solid lines are in the plane of your screen. So in the plane of the screen, that's where these solid lines are. Now the wedged lines, these lines are actually coming out of the screen towards you, right? So in other words, this hydrogen is closer to you than this carbon. And the dashed lines are like the opposite. The dashed lines are actually going into the screen, away from you. So that means that this hydrogen back here is further away from this carbon to you. Does that make sense? I hope it does. <laughs> so that's basically structural formulas. They may or may not show geometry. Uh, sometimes it's not necessary to show geometry. Sometimes it's only necessary to show connectivity. It just depends on how specific uh, you want to you be with it and what in particular you're talking about. So that's structural formulas. Now I'd like to move on to molecular models. And there's two main types of molecular models, and those are the ball and stick and space filling models. So a ball and stick model for ethanol looks something like this. Notice that the atoms are shown as spheres and the chemical bonds between the atoms are shown as sticks. Ball and stick models are useful because they not only show how many atoms of each element they are, they not only show um, you know, uh, the connectivity and the, and the geometry, but they also show the relative sizes of the atoms. So that's pretty useful. 
but perhaps the most accurate representation of what the ethanol molecule or any mo molecule for that matter is going to look like is going to be the space filling model. So this right here is actually is actually a space filling model of ethanol. Now sometimes ball and stick models are more useful than space filling models because depending on which angle you're looking at with a space filling model, uh, certain atoms might be hidden from other atoms. In other words, if this molecule was tilted just a little bit, we wouldn't see this hydrogen back here and we might get the wrong idea of how many atoms there are. So in that sense, a ball and stick model could be more useful than a space filling model because it might be easier to see all of the atoms in the model. But again, if you want to look at the best most accurate uh, geometric representation of a molecule, uh, then you would, you would definitely go with the space filling model. All right, so there is chemical formulas and molecular models. I hope this video helped you out a little bit, and uh, that's it. So take it easy.